See the difference? At Sinai then, <coughs> the Israelites, rather than renew the Abrahamic covenant by faith, formed or made by unbelief the old covenant in which there was no savior and no forgiveness of sins. It was obey and live or disobey and die. They promised to do what they could never get done without the Savior promised in the Abrahamic covenant. Listen to how Paul puts it in Romans chapter 10 and verse 3. Romans 10, 3. Turn with me. Romans 10, 3. You have it? Romans 10, 3. <coughs> Romans 10, 3. Romans 10, 3. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, so at the heart of the old covenant is ignorance of God's righteousness or character. And going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the whole purpose of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Now, <clears throat> this is beautiful. Let's continue. <clears throat> Read Romans 10.3 and understand what really happened. They sought to establish their own righteousness by their own obedience to the law apart from Christ. Everybody still following? Now, something here is important. You see that part there, obey and live and disobey and die? <clears throat> People usually ask why the punishments in the Old Testament in that particular period were so cruel. And they forget that the, old, the Israelites in that period of time had chosen a covenant and had formed a covenant in which there is no savior and no forgiveness of sin. It was obey and live or disobey and die. When Abraham made any mistake under the new covenant, and Abraham made mistakes <coughs> under the new covenant, there was no exhibition of wrath like we see later on because notwithstanding his mistakes, Abraham trusted in the Savior to come whose blood on Calvary would cancel his sin. People at Sinai now formed a covenant without a savior and without any mercy and without any forgiveness. <laughs> so when they committed any wrong, they therefore had to be given rules of swift punishment because they formed a covenant without salvation. Pardon? Yes, that's exactly that false religion in the East. No salvation. And therefore people... People, like, people judge God's character wrongfully, not realizing that Israel not only chose their own military system and their own judicial system, but they have formed a covenant in which there was no mercy. <clears throat> God, who was longing to forgive them, they had rejected that mercy by rejecting the Abrahamic covenant. And God does not force himself here. He's not wanted. So when you see that ruthless lack of mercy, it doesn't reflect upon God. It reflects upon the people having rejected God's love and mercy in the Christ of the Abrahamic covenant. Whoa. Let's move on. <clears throat> it should be clear then that the old covenant was not the Ten Commandment moral law per se. It was the people's promise to obey the law apart from the promised Savior of the Abrahamic or New Covenant. But so attached to the written code did they become that the Old Covenant which they formed was equated with the written code of the Ten Commandments so that I have the writers of the Bible actually calling the written code the Old Covenant because of the people's attachment to it virtually idolatrously. <clears throat> Next section that we're going to stress the righteousness of God, the basis of his covenant. 
God's righteousness must be the basis of his everlasting covenant. This righteousness was and is the promise and the promised seed, Christ. When God gave his promise to Abraham, he gave his righteousness to Abraham, and Abraham received that righteousness as a free gift. Remember in our earlier chapters, we saw that God's righteousness is Christ. The Ten Commandment Moral Law is a transcript of God's righteousness. It is God's righteousness expressed in human language. <clears throat> God gave the moral law to show the Israelites their need of his living righteousness, that is, their need of Christ. Righteousness and life can never be extracted from a written code. The written code of the Ten Commandments was given to show them and us our sinfulness and to give us no reprieve until it brings us to Christ to receive him. This is the schoolmaster function of the law which it performs today as well as in the pre-cross era. Everybody following? <clears throat> Moreover, it is vitally important to understand that since the Ten Commandment written code summarizes the righteousness of God, there can be no discrepancy between any of the Ten Commandments and the righteousness received in Christ. When Christ dwells in the believer's heart, the Ten Commandments will be kept. The Apostle Paul is clear on this point in Romans 8, 1 to 4, where he explains that in Christ, the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in the believer by being written in the heart, Hebrews 10, 16. <clears throat> now we come to another bitter point that is difficult, was difficult for Smith and Butler, difficult for many people today too. Listen carefully, the promised inheritance. <clears throat> In Genesis 13, 15, God told Abraham that all the land which his vision took in would be given to him and to his seed forever. Now, people don't like this term. You see, people don't like to understand that there's something called rightly dividing the word of truth. You open your Bibles to Genesis 13, 15, and what do you see? God telling Abraham, I want you to look now at all the land you can see. I am given to you and your seed forever. You heard what the text says? All the land you can see. All right. The Apostle Paul interpreted the Genesis 13, 15 inheritance in Romans 4, 13 to mean the world. Well, well, well. Watch it. You read Genesis 13, 15 and all you see is Abraham, all the land you can see belongs to you. Listen to Paul. Romans 4, 13 is written down there for you for the promise that he should be heir of all the land he could see. Half the church sleeping. Half the church sleeping. For the promise that he should be heir of all the land that he could see. The whole world was to Abraham, was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. In other words, all the land that he could see in Genesis 13, 15 is all of a sudden interpreted by Paul to mean the world. <clears throat> well, well, well. <clears throat> but Paul did not even stop there. In Hebrews 11, 10, Paul wrote that Abraham looked for the new Jerusalem. He looked for a city whose maker and builder is God. So look, look how the apostle Paul deals with scripture. Now, Answer me. Do you, have you ever read how Jones reasoned out how Paul must have arrived at his conclusion? <clears throat> Jones says this world, because it is a sinful world, is cursed. And therefore has to be burnt up. 
And the world over which the second Adam will have jurisdiction is the earth made new. And John says that Paul used that line to arrive at this argument. It was incontrovertible. Hmm? In other words, Abraham saw with his physical eyes at the earthly level, but saw with his spiritual eyes the new heavens and the new earth and the kingdom to come. That's what Paul said. He looked for a city whose maker and builder is God. That's amazing exegesis. Now watch it now. Let's look at... Uh, <clears throat> Oh, let's read on. Let's read on. In other words, the promised inheritance is what? The earth made new, which Christ and his saints will possess after the millennium of Revelation 20. Before that, of course, they will be in the New Jerusalem. Hence, Wagner understood the statement. Let's read Galatians 3.19. Back to Galatians 3.19. This is a text which gives a lot of people trouble. It gives Smith and Butler trouble. Galatians 3. 19. Watch it. Galatians 3.19. Wherefore then serve of the law. It was added. We already proved that this word added already means spoken. Because of transgressions or the law entered because of transgressions. Watch it. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Pause. The Sunday keepers argued that this statement till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, referred to the first advent of Christ. And therefore they argued that the law, that the old covenant, and therefore the law, they argued, finished with the first advent of Christ. And Wagner said, no, you don't have to be afraid. Butler and Smith, you don't have to be afraid of those arguments. They're wrong. This text is not speaking of the first advent of Christ. Are you following me? You following Wagner? No, these are lines... When you see God send light through men, like how he sent that light through, we're going to do reasoning was beyond theology of the day. You had men with all sorts of doctrines of theology of the day who couldn't march off all of this because it was a pure line from the throne of God and not from the institutions of men. So we're going to say, Galatians 3.19 till the seed should come to whom the promise was made is not speaking of the first advent. Let's go on. <clears throat> Wagner well, understood the statement in Galatians 3.19 till the seed should come to whom the promise was made to be speaking not of the first advent but of the second and third advents of Jesus as King of Kings and Lord of Lords to possess and reign over the new heavens and the new earth. Therefore, Galatians 3.19 does not teach that the functions of the law cease at the first advent, but that those functions endure to the end of time. Fantastic. You see, and the Sunday keepers using that had Butler and Smith in trouble. And we're going to say, you, all, you don't have to be afraid of those Sunday keepers. We can use the law in Galatians 3, prove that it is the moral law, and show that it doesn't cease its function until the end of the world, until every last sinner is, is saved. This was revolutionary stuff. <clears throat> and as the man who wrote a book on this recently uh, said, sadly, most of the theologians in the Adventist church, let alone in the world, have any clue of this light. They're not taught it. And if you mention it to them, they call it false doctrine. We're coming on to the end now. But any study of the covenants and the history is always sweet. <clears throat> and I hope we make sure that we know it in and out. Paul's analysis of Abraham's two sons in Galatians 4, 21 and 23. Over the page, last section. <clears throat> Abraham and Sarah had God's new covenant promises. The central promise was the promise of a son. After what they considered a long wait, unbelief developed in Sarah's mind, and she suggested to Abraham a scheme 
by which he could obtain a son. She told Abraham to go into Hagar and get a son. This he did, but soon there was trouble, and Sarah regretted her decision to let Abraham get a son from Hagar. All of this you knew, you know, and it was recently ably gone through by Elder Newton. Later on, Abraham's and Sarah's faith in God's promise was restored, and Isaac, the son of promise, was born. Ishmael, the son of the born woman, born woman means slave, Hagar, was born after the flesh. Isaac, the son of the free woman, Sarah, was born by the promise of God. In an amazing piece of inspired exegesis, the Apostle Paul tells us in Galatians 4.24 that the two births of the two sons from the two women are the two covenants. Well, well, well. That's amazing, huh? The birth of Ishmael from Hagar was equivalent to the Sinai or Old Covenant and is a producer of bondage, Paul says. And the birth of Isaac from Sarah was the new covenant, which is freedom, hallelujah, from sin. The Hagar-Ishmael development was the result of unbelief in God's promise, which led to the Abraham-Sarah attempt to fulfill God's promise by their own works of the flesh. Notice how Ishmael was born. Ishmael was born because, because of Sarah's and Abraham's unbelief. Listen to this one. Now, to all appearances, Ishmael was a handsome, physically strong, well-built young man. What could be wrong with him? The fact was that however good he looked, he was not the son of promise and could not fulfill God's purpose. So however good machinery may look without the Holy Spirit, it is not the son of promise and cannot fulfill the purpose of God. And that is what we just read in the letter to Smith. She said, you all have rejected the Holy Spirit, which is the efficiency you need to finish the work. The efficiency to finish the work is not found in our superabundant machinery and advances and so on, though God will use them when they are submitted to him. The efficiency is in the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Back in the days of the apostles, they didn't have any technology, okay? Now, don't think I'm speaking against technology because God will use it. I'm just mentioning a point. And the apostles preached their loud cry, as it were, their Pentecost, and the whole world heard it, and everybody heard it in their own languages because who was the technology? The Holy Spirit. Okay. Next point. Since Paul calls the Hagar Ishmael outcome <coughs> the Sinai covenant, it means that at Sinai, the Israelites, everybody following? Out of unbelief in God's promises, produce their own promises and their own efforts of the flesh to produce righteousness and to earn the inheritance by works of law rather, by, rather than by the faith of Christ. Old covenant experience may coexist with new covenant experience in a church, but ultimately trouble will develop. Whatever is born of the flesh ultimately will persecute whatever is born of the spirit, leading eventually to separation between the two, as Paul says in Galatians 4, 29 to 30. In the same way that the birth of Ishmael was not of God, so too the Sinaitic covenant was not of God. The Israelites had freedom of choice, and they chose unbelief, and thereby formed the old covenant. Many people get confused because God referred to the Sinai covenant as the covenant I made with them. But this is simply God saying that he allowed them to make their self-motivated promise, and rather than abandon them, he sought to let them learn from their mistakes 
that their promises and efforts of the flesh to get righteousness from the written code could never be successful. It is just like when God told them, having a king is not my way. But when they chose to have a king, who anointed their kings? God. And who said, he's the king I've chosen? God. Notice the language. And if you don't understand this language, you will always be in trouble. So as I said, you have a, a, a brand of people walking about saying now, they don't mind the people at Bailey sell through for the final generation. They're taking the Bible exactly as it reads. I say any Adventist who takes the Bible exactly as it reads, rather than exactly as it means, by letting the word interpret the word, will be in trouble. Because it will come across statements like these. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. The smoke of their torment ascend up forever and ever. The worm never dies. God hardens their hearts. And you will be in serious trouble when you meet the Sandy Keepers. Of all people, Adventists should know, we don't go by the surface meaning, like the Apostle Paul, we rightly divide to let Scripture interpret Scripture. Summary. The Abrahamic covenant was the new or everlasting covenant. It was God's promise of Christ. Christ is the new covenant. In him we have righteousness and rest, which will be manifested in obedience to the Ten Commandments and keeping the seventh day Sabbath. The Sinaitic covenant was the old covenant formed by the empty promises of the unbelieving Israelites at Mount Sinai. Throughout history, both before and after the cross, the new and old covenants have been and are conditions of the heart, either of faith or of unbelief, respectively. The faith of Christ has set us free from the condemnation of sin, including the charge of the murder of the Son of God. Faith in him receives that freedom as a living experience with the Holy Spirit reproducing his victory in the believer's character. Hallelujah. Paul says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Romans 8.1 Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not again entangled with the yoke of liberty. Galatians 5.1 and the yoke of bondage, sorry. Be not again entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Thank you. And Hebrews 10, 16 and 17. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds, and I will write them, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Hebrews 10, 16 and 17. The new covenant is the everlasting gospel of justification by the faith of Jesus to be experienced by faith in Jesus, as we heard this morning. Faith in Christ, watch it now, faith in Christ means abiding in Christ. And so long as the believer abides in Christ, victory over sin is guaranteed. It is when we step out of the abiding relationship that we are defeated. The old covenant is the attempt of self to extract righteousness from a written code or any set of rules apart from Christ. It can never work. And the final comparison, old covenant, new covenant. Old covenant is in self. The new covenant is in Christ. The old covenant is by the promise of self. The new covenant is by God's promise. Old covenant by the word of man. New covenant by God's word. The old covenant reckoned as debt owed for work done. The new covenant by God's grace. Old covenant must be earned. Whatever God is given, his promise must be earned. New covenant is God's free gift. The old covenant by works. New covenant by faith. Old covenant by the flesh. New covenant by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Old covenant produces bondage to fear of death. New covenant produces freedom in love and righteousness. 
Old covenant, there is no real heart obedience. In the new covenant, there is genuine, hallelujah, obedience. So never think that the new covenant is against obedience. It is the only way to genuinely obey. Old covenant, law written on stone. Now tell me something. You didn't even have time to go through Paul's other analysis. Letters written on stone. Anything you try to obey that is written anywhere else but in your heart, you are a slave. If not, smoking is not in your heart, but is on a notice in a bank. You always have to be looking at the sign, don't smoke, or your hand slipping in your pocket. Don't smoke. Don't smoke. Because it is not in your heart. So anytime the law is only written on stone, we are in trouble. God intends to write it in our hearts by having Christ in us through the Holy Spirit. There is true freedom and liberty and there is true power to obey. If you are not a smoker, so that the law thou shall not smoke is in your heart, you never even have to think about the law when you go in a bank because you're not smoking. You don't have to look at it. It is in your heart. Continuing then. So, Old Covenant is law written on stone. New Covenant, law written in the heart. The Old Covenant is self-righteousness. The New Covenant, Christ or righteousness. In the Old Covenant, watch it, there is no rest. In the New Covenant, Christ is our rest that we celebrated on the same seventh day that God did in the beginning. In the Old Covenant, there is no forgiveness. That's why there, there are such harsh penalties you see written down there. In the New Covenant, free and full forgiveness. And this free and full forgiveness doesn't give license. The law is written in the heart. You abide in Christ and there is genuine obedience. The old covenant is the old birth. The birth from your mother. The new covenant is the new birth. The birth from the Holy Spirit. The old covenant, the inheritance believed to be Palestine and the earthly Jerusalem and they're fighting out there going to kill one another for it. The new covenant, the earth made new, and the new Jerusalem, hallelujah. I implore you to go over this and all the other light that has come on the covenants and make sure as a congregation we are settled in what God sent through Dr. Wagner in that period 1884 to 1896. He proved it from the Bible and Bible alone. Make sure we follow his line and satisfy ourselves that we know it and not just know it to talk about it. Above all, experience it. Even as Brother Newton in his series has been showing us the importance of experiencing it through the examples of men like Joseph and so on. All right, that's the end of the presentation. Any points or questions briefly? The floor is yours.